Hello, everyone. I'm Colleen Becker, a Senior Policy Specialist with the NCSL Health Program. And on behalf of the National Conference of State Legislatures, I would like to welcome all of you to today's webinar, Taken by Surprise, State Approaches to Surprise Medical Billing. I would like to remind participants that NCSL is a bipartisan membership organization of all 50 state legislatures and the territories. Our members include the 7,383 legislators and thousands more legislative staff. NCSL advocates for the interest of state and provides policymakers the opportunity to exchange ideas. Today's webinar is a platform for information exchange and engagement. Over the next 60 minutes, we encourage participation through our chat box, so feel free at any time to type your questions or respond to any questions in the chat box, which is in the lower left hand of your screen. To begin building some comfortability with the chat function and also learn who is in, on the line today, I invite you to type in the state from which you are calling now. I want to briefly mention how to access the slide decks. Above the presentation, you will see a couple tabs with one of them labeled resources. Here you can find and download a PDF version of the PowerPoints used today. Another tab is labeled speaker, where you can read the bios of today's esteemed speakers. You can access these tabs at any time during the presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on NCSL's website within the week. Before I introduce today's fantastic panel of speakers, I want to take, thank Arnold Ventures for their support of today's webinar. Our first presenter today is Christopher Kohler, president at the Millbank Memorial Fund. Before joining the fund, he served for eight years in the, in the state of Rhode Island as the country's first state health insurance commissioner. Under his leadership, the Rhode Island Office of the Health Insurance Commissioner was nationally recognized for its rate review process and its efforts to use insurance regulation to promote payment reform, primary care revitalization, and delivery system transformation. Our next presenter will be Kevin Lucia, who is a research professor and project director at Georgetown University Center on Health Insurance Reform. He conducts extensive, extensive legal analysis on how states and the federal government regulate private health insurance with a focus on access, affordability, and adequacy of coverage. He will be followed by his colleague, Dr. Jack Hoadley, research professor emeritus from Georgetown University's McCourt School of Public Policy. In 35 years as a health policy researcher, he has studied a wide range of health financing topics focusing on Medicare, Medicaid, and private health insurance. And finally, we will hear from Representative Denea Escar from Colorado. Representative Vestar is in her third term in the Colorado House of Representatives. She serves as chair of the Joint Budget Committee and vice chair of the Appropriations Committee. During her six years in the legislature, she has worked to improve affordability and access to health care, and she is also known for her work on issues of equality, education, justice, and poverty. While NCSL values bipartisanship due to the current rapid pace of state houses, we had numerous cancellations from other legislators to discuss approaches in their state. And with that, Mr. Kohler, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. And good afternoon, everybody. I want to um, get my slides in the right place. Okay, everyone should be looking at the title slide for uh, the Millbank Memorial Fund. I'll go to the next one. Um, I want to thank NCSL for the chance to um, uh, make this presentation and also the chance to introduce and sort of do the setup for our um, uh, uh, experts, Kevin and Jack. Um, this is a slide that just simply describes what the Milbank Memorial Fund is. Our mission is to improve population health by connecting leaders and decision makers with the best evidence and experience. We focus primarily on uh, state health policy leaders such as you folks. Um, and we do this work through communications, through convening state health policy decision makers, and um, building communities of policymakers around specific projects. Um, so what I want to do is set a little bit of the frame for surprise bills before we, um, uh, Kevin and Jack talk about the specific options that you folks are, are facing and some of the specific details. 
The, the big frame here for us is the way our health care costs continue to grow. And what you see here is representative, a representation of health care inflation relative to our gross domestic product, increases in our GDP. Um, the good news is that health care cost inflation has been going down. The bad news is that it still remains higher than the prices of goods and services. And so long as health care is rising faster than the general economy, that presents real problems, for, particularly for employers who only have uh, the price of their goods and services and are facing an excess demand for, um, uh, from the health care economy. Um, employers react to the face of the, in, in the face of this pressure by shifting more costs to employees. This is a depiction of um, the growth in companies that are offering high deductible health plans with saving options um, by company size. Um, you can see that with uh, the exception of um, small employers, um, the numbers continue to climb. What that creates for em uh, employees is increasing cost pressures that they have to deal with. Um, uh, and so, and well, the, what that's what it creates for employees. What I would say it creates for employers is, um, uh, excuse me, for providers is they react to this cost shifting um, with consolidation and this cost, these cost increases. Um, I'm, I don't think that this slide worked out. I apologize for that um, because of, uh, 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 I got a little bit too cute with PowerPoint. What this is intended to represent is that um, both health systems are consolidating over time, but also provider groups. Why are they consolidating? They're doing it, frankly, to gain leverage in commercial health insurance negotiations. But not only are they consolidating, they're looking, as they get bigger, at activities to maximize their revenues. And I've highlighted um, four different tactics that they use, including tougher uh, negotiations with um, payers by virtue of their size. Um, they are being more comprehensive in terms of how they build, making sure that they capture all revenue opportunities that are out there. If they can't come to agreement with the health insurers, they are staying out of network, um, and they are also getting more aggressive with their debt collection for services that are not covered by health insurance. And that's going to be the basis for what we um, are going to be talking about here today with surprise bills. In the face of this pressure and both the, the increasing health care costs and the reaction by uh, providers, we shouldn't be surprised that consumers and, and the general public are facing um, increasing concerns about their ability to afford their medical bills. I want to note the two um, most important concerns that are raised here um, in a survey done by the Kaiser Family Foundation. Higher than prescription drug costs, higher than utility bills, health insurance premiums, rent or mortgage, is the fear of unexpected medical bills. And Kaiser was in, important in distinguishing the fear of unexpected medical bills from the fear of deductibles. What, uh, what we're really dealing with with surprise bills is the unknown or the uncertain. People can even budget for deductibles as well as for their share of premiums. What they can't budget for is something that's unexpected, a surprise bill. <clears throat> and that's what we're talking about here. So it's important when we talk about surprise bills to understand what triggers them. They result from interactions with providers or patients that would reasonably assume to be in network but are not. So when we talk about surprise bills, that's our definition. I thought I was getting a service that was in network with a covered benefit, but it was not. And I really didn't have any choice in the matter. They come from three situations, and we have some more detail on this in a subsequent slide. One is emergency room visits. The second is non-emergency care at an in-network at a at an in-network facility, and you have some examples here. Often it comes from you think the facility is you know the facility is in-network, but you haven't checked on the providers, and the providers who contract independently from the facility have decided no, I'm not going to participate. Um, this particularly comes up with anesthesiologists, radiologists, pathologists, some of the assisters in um, the surgical facility. And then the third, and in some ways the most pressing example, is ambulance services, both ground and air ambulance. I want to draw a distinction, and Jack and Kevin will talk about this, between surprise bills and balance bills. A balance bill is subject to an insurance contract. It is the balance 
that I have to pay by virtue of my contract um, after the insurance has paid their, more, their portion. Because it's a covered service, the provider is limited to collect what they have accepted from the, um, uh, what are limited to collect what they have agreed to in contract uh, um, with the insurer. Um, because there was, let's say there was a deductible, um, they've agreed to the amount. They just have to collect it from me as opposed to from the insurer. That's as opposed to a surprise medical bill, which is, as we noticed, from an outwork network, is for uncovered services and is not necessarily subject to the contracted rate that a provider has agreed to. Therefore, there is no maximum, uh, there is no allowed amount that the provider and the health plan have agreed to. So as you as legislators, as staff, as policymakers working on this, it's important to draw the distinction between a surprise bill on the one hand and what is a balance bill on the other hand. And Jack and Kevin are going to talk more about that. I got a little bit of data um, from Jack and Kevin about what are the sources of these um, surprise bills. You can see that 59% of all air ambulance visits are not covered by insurers and therefore result in some sort of a surprise bill that again, where the, the amount that the provider can charge is not by an insurance contract. 51% of ground ambulance, um, less of inpatient emergency rooms, but still a lot, and then um, relatively less of elective inpatient care. You can think of these as the sources of headaches, particularly air ambulance, because it is so expensive um, and so results in a, a, a very diff costly and difficult negotiation process for um, the consumer who didn't really have any other choices and now they're caught with this. Um, the other thing to understand is that um, uh, surprise bills vary geographically in terms of their frequency. You can see the darker the green here, um, the more likely, um, the more common um, uh, out-of-network uh, emergency visits occurred and thus generating a, um, a surprise bill. The, the proportion of surprise bills in a state that are, uh, or the proportion of visits, let's in this case emergency room visits, that are subject to a surprise bill is a function of whether or not there um, is insurance coverage and the extensiveness of that insurance coverage. So you can see that um, states with more comprehensive insurance coverage, um, uh, great, uh, lesser use of um, uh, plans that are not um, authorized under the Affordable Care Act are less likely to have surprise bills. That's kind of the takeaway from here. Um, where I want to end with before handing it off to Jack and Kevin is to, as a, as a former insurance regulator, when I would work with legislators and their staff, I wanted them, and they would ask me for advice or counsel as they were developing bills, I would want to make sure that I understood what their particular goals were. In the case of surprise bills, I think the fundamental thing, um, my understanding is that usually the goal is some form of consumer protection. We have a three-way dispute between providers, health plans, and the patient, the consumer. Um, it is determined that there is a public interest in limiting the consumer liability and taking the consumer out of the dispute. I would note that when you do this, I'm reminded of utilization review and managed care discussions in the 1990s. Much of what Kevin and Jack are gonna talk about is how do we have a reliable structure and process for dispute resolution. We want something that is replicable over time with minimum amount of uh, uh, government interference and government oversight so that the parties that are involved the, uh, the patient, the insurer, and the provider have a reliable, predictable way of resolving their disputes. Um, and finally, I would um, uh, urge you as policymakers to think ahead and think of how affected parties might react. Often in policymaking, we are subject to kind of a cat and mouse game where if you take one action, there will be a reaction. So can we anticipate what the, um, what will be the reactions and prepare for that. That's why often simple, reliable structures and processes um, are some of the best and most effective policies that you can put in place. If our goal is healthcare affordability, we should note that we're improving affordability for consumers, but this is not addressing overall costs for the system. 
um, because surprise bills are a relatively small portion of overall health care costs, this relentless rise above inflation. And finally, um, as anyone who's dealt with health care understands, and I saw this as an insurance regulator, one person's expense is another person's revenue. There is particular concern around the terms and the, uh, that are decided for, for surprise billing because they're seen as precedent setting. What we determine for out-of-network billing could be um, the terms that are put in place that providers might use for in-network building. You're creating, a, you're creating an alternative to being in-network, and therefore you're changing the in-network negotiations because, in effect, you are, the, the provider and the health plan now know what the provider's alternative to going in-network is. So there's a significant amount of precedent setting here and, and attention, although it is a relatively small portion of um, expenses in the healthcare system. Um, I hope that information has been helpful. Kevin and Jack are going to continue with more details about the particular options that are emerging in different states based on the experience of the states so far. Thank you very much. Hi, this is um, Kevin Lucher and, um, at Georgetown University, and I just wanted to first uh, thank um, NCSL for inviting Georgetown to be part of the discussion today. Um, over the last uh, 10 years, Jack and Jack Holdley, who's also going to be speaking um, next, and I have, have teamed up really to, to kind of study this issue and to really try to understand um, the discussion at the federal level and then also the emergent regulation of balance billing at the state level. Um, much of our work has been funded by the Commonwealth Fund, the base research, but more recently we've been funded under um, the Arnold Foundation to provide technical assistance to federal um, policymakers and also states to state policymakers. Um, and, and um, it's, it's a way to connect the research and the experience that we know from states to people, um, policymakers that um, kind of want to go and, and regulate in this area. Um, so on, on balance billing, you, you know, who is really protected today under federal and state law? Um, generally, I, I think it's safe to, 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 uh, to kind of categorize folks that are enrolled in Medicare or Medicaid uh, VA and TRICARE as being generally protected. There are some exceptions that we won't focus on today, but happy to set up another call if anybody was interested in, in limitations of those. And then, of course, for your fully insured um, group health plans and your individual market policies, um, including those that are sold through the, uh, um, through, the, through the marketplaces, it really depends on the states. Um, and, and whether the state has regulated in this area. And we're going to talk about um, some of the trends that we're seeing at the state level. What is not protected, and this is partly because at the federal level, there are really no protections against balance billing. Um, there, there are some, some requirements that might mitigate the extent of balance billing, but generally um, at the federal level, there are no protections. And so enrollees that are covered under self-funded employee plans, um, which as we all know are a majority of um, Americans that are covered under private health insurance, are, are not protected from balance billing. So even if a state regulates in this area, there's this wide open hole where um, th those that are only regulated under federal um, uh, uh, standards are, are not protected and those are the self-funded enrollees. Um, in looking at the ways in which states have um, regulated in this area, um, just as a base, you, you know, some of the some of the elements of, of a balanced billing protection would include um, a, a billing prohibition. That's that's actually requiring you, you know a, a standard on a provider that they can't balance bill in those scenarios that Chris um, Chris mentioned. Um, typically, it's coupled with a hold harmless provision where um, the, the issuer has to hold the consumer harmless um, in those surprise billing scenarios by limiting the responsibility of their cost sharing to their in-network in levels. Um, you, can, you can tell, like, if you, if you have 
a hold harmless provision without a balanced billing protection or a prohibition on the provider that consumers could could may or may very well be protected from balanced billing but yet still face balanced billing because there's nothing that stops the provider from continuing to um, bill the consumer. Um, states have explored disclosure requirements. We often see this as a, as a first discussion. If we just give consumers more information, they can make better choices. Will they make choices in a way that um, protects themselves or mitigates the risk of balanced billing? And generally, what we've found in states that, um, that have experimented with, with straight-up disclosure requirements um, find that consumers um, can never quite get enough information to protect themselves from the scenarios that um, they end up in that that may um, they, they may face um, balanced billing, and that's partly because these are often situations where the consumer has no control, and they don't have the time to really in in the, in the moment to kind of do the the amount of research and thinking that it would take in communications with both the issuer and the provider to be able to protect themselves from, from balanced billing. So disclosure requirements seem to be an important element in the states that have actually you know, regulated in this area, but uh, it, it, typically it, it's not enough to completely um, protect the consumer. Um, the largest, the, the biggest issue that I think we've um, struggled with is or states have struggled with is is, is figuring out how to ensure that um, th there's a reasonable reimbursement level that's acceptable both for the and for the issuer. Some states have experimented with um, a reimbursement benchmark that's pegged to Medicare. Um, for example, in California, 125% of Medicare. Sometimes it's the average contracted rate. Uh, Washington has used this term com uh, commercially reasonable rate. Um, other states have looked at um, independent dispute resolution. I think the, the, the example out there is, is, that's often pointed to is New York, but many other states um, have IDR that's in place in their states. Um, and there's a, 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 a various um, you know, ways in which um, a state could do um, IDR. Sometimes it's pointed out in New York this is a basic file where each party offers one, and the arbitrator has to choose um, between those two um, the, those two levels of reimbursement. Um, so, and, and then more recently, there's been an emergence of of what we call a mixture or a split the baby approach, um, where there's a reimbursement benchmark that's set that that's um, set from the state, and to go immediately. Um, and then if that doesn't satisfy the provider, then uh, it triggers the possibility of um, uh, IDR. So that's, that's an emergent approach, which isn't so specific, um, uh, leaning towards a benchmark or dispute resolution, but mixes them up. Um, state legislative activity. So we, we have been tracking this for, for many, many years now. Um, and most recently, our work has been spotlighted with the Commonwealth Fund. Um, I would just let you know that there's some incredible resources that are available through the Commonwealth Fund now. They have an interactive map where, you know, a state can, uh, a policymaker can can really see all the different features of a particular state that has been um, regulating this area. Um, and we've also, um, y you can also see, um, y you know, multiple um, grid presentations that show you exactly the, the major features of, of, of state state approaches. I would also say we have an, um, a growing amount of resources that kind of, you know, uh, spotlight the federal discussions, which Jack will be talking, or proposals, which Jack will be talking about. Um, and, and some of the interactive issues between federal and 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 that are out there. The way that we've kind of um, tried to uh, uh, um, categorize um, state state approaches to balanced billing, um, we we have have uh, set up a criteria um, when we look at a, bal a state balance billing protection to see if it's um, what we call comprehensive or a comprehensive approach. And what we're really looking for 
is um, to, to ensure that uh, states have uh, extended these protections both into the ER setting and then also into the network hospital setting. Um, we, we also are looking to see whether a state has applied their laws to all types of insurance, so you know HMOs and people, um, that they're actually protecting um, consumers by holding them harmless, but also, as I mentioned before, also pro prohibiting providers from balanced billing. So it's almost like the combination of those two is the ultimate protection for consumers. If you have one um, without the other, then there is this, still this possibility that a consumer could be um, could, could be in a position of, of uh, experiencing um, balanced billing. Um, and then, of course, um, you, you know we're looking for an approach that the state has kind of sanctioned. Um, to resolve the the adequate payment uh, an adequate payment standard or IDR or a mixture mixture of both. Um, as of July of uh, 2019, we we had 13 states that had kind of met our criteria of being a comprehensive balance billing protection state. A lot of other states that had partial protections, meaning they had one feature in our in our analysis. Um, and what we find is that some states, and that, by the way, that still leaves many states that um, currently do not have any um, balance billing protections um, in, in place. I would say the, the, um, the, the states with comprehensive um, balance billing protections are going to grow this year. Uh, we already have Virginia and, and Georgia who have recently passed legislation, um, although they're still um, waiting to be signed by the governor. Um, that, that would kind of bring them into this criteria of, be, of being a comprehensive balance billing protection state. But I, I would just note that um, there are a number of states out there that have um, some protections in place. For example, maybe they protect people in the ER setting or they have some sort of dispute resolution process that mitigates the potential of being balance billed, but it's not an outright ban on balance billing. So we, we try to characterize both those states and the comprehensive states, and all of those are available on this interactive map that is available on, on Commonwealth, but it really allows you to see the features of each, each state. Um, some lessons, just high level um, from, the, from the states. Um, what, what, we, what we found is, you know, states have, uh, you know, try, some states in the comprehensive states are, we're, we've been looking at the network hospital setting and the ER setting, um, but, but there's also, you know, ambulance services, as Chris mentioned, that has been much more difficult for states to regulate around. I believe that only Colorado is integrated into that, that into their balance billing. Um, also, out-of-network hospitals, um, when a consumer goes um, to, a, to the ER in an out-of-network hospital, um, you know, some states protect um, consumers in that setting. The ER setting in-network or out-of-network, they're still protected from balance billing. Um, some states have a limitation, so it only applies to their PAR hospitals. Um, some states define providers that are kind of you know, prohibited from balance billing in a narrow way versus, you know, um, uh, uh, all providers. Um, and so that's another area that we've, we've, we've tried to study and understand. Um, there are a few states, um, New, New Washington, that, that have an opt-in for ERISA plan. So they've, they've um, you, you know, opportunity for employers that have self-funded plans to balance billing mechanism for resolving balance billing um, disputes. Um, one thing I would say is even if a state, you know, regulates balance billing and they have a comprehensive balance billing protection, when, they're in, when their residents go to a different state or are touched by a border state provider, they can still face balance billing. And, and, and you, you know, in that situation, it's difficult to protect the consumer because the state can regulate the issuer 
that's covering that um, that resident, but they can't regulate the provider in another state. And so, you know, that's an issue where, you, you know, I tend to think that um, it, it makes this issue important to have some federal interaction. Um, we, we also, um, you know, there's always an ongoing um, debate, I think, in states that are contemplating regulating in this area, figuring out what that acceptable payment standard is, or figuring out, you know, if they if they do land on an on, on, on embracing IDR, you know, what limits the, the, the amount of cases that kind of go to IDR? What are the guardrails that are around there? So we've been exploring those, those guardrails. And then also, there's also enforcement considerations. Who's going to make sure that providers don't balance bill when they're regulated? Who's going to um, ensure that issuers are actually holding consumers harmless, typically the Department of Insurance? Um, but in some states, there's also the Attorney General who's been involved. But coming up with that scheme, you know, to make sure that enforcement is in, intact after the past comprehensive balance billing protection has been has been important and something that we've been studying state to state. Um, the impact of state policies. I, I just want to first of all say, you know, we we very few balance billing protections have been in place for very long. So. Um, you know, I tend to think that, you know, we won't really understand the impact of some of these state laws for, a, you know, many more years. Um, take a long time for these market dynamics to, to, to work out. New York is always pointed to as, as being um, you know, an example of an arbitration approach. And, um, and, and there has been some early research um, to suggest that um, you, you, some one qualitative study that was done by one of my colleagues here at Georgetown, which you, you know, like, was clear that th there was consensus that the law really did achieve its primary goal, and that it protected people from balance billing in the ER setting, and also the hospital setting. Um, but there, it, it seemed a little too early to figure out what the what what the the impact was. Um, you know, as far as market dynamics, there is some um, recent um, evidence from CBO to suggest that there is a, uh, an inflationary approach. But then there's other, and 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 that too has been um, there's been some work out of Brookings that suggests that 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 there is a approach to the New York arbitration style um, resolution of balance billing. But um, there's also you know folks. Um, suggesting that maybe it's a little too early and more work has to be done, more cases, more understanding um, uh, what, what the impact is. California is an example, as I mentioned. Um, you, you know, reimbursement standards have been is more of a rate-setting approach, um, pegged to Medicare at 125%. You have your typical, you know, discussions back and forth about doctors and issuers arguing whether they're how the impact has been. Um, there has been some qualitative research out um, from from Rand um, suggesting a mixed impact approach. Um, Brookings um, recently came out with some analysis to suggest that there's actually few fewer uh, out of network claims, which suggests that um, you, you know maybe there's um, the, 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 that the networks are uh, it's not impacting that network and that, that doctors are actually um, you, you know the, these networks are, uh, are not being um, re reduced under the, under the California um, approach. So gaps in in state regulation, as we as I just wrap up these slides, um, you, you know the, there's still a lot of states out there that have um, do not have laws protecting consumers. Um, states do not have jurisdiction over self-funded plans. Um, they also don't have uh, currently uh, jurisdiction over air ambulance services, and um, this issue about residents of one state that may be covered under a comprehensive um, balance billing protection um, not being protected, you, you know, if they get services in a, in, a, in a different state. And I think those four reasons, for me at least, um, make this issue. Um, 
ripe for federal interaction. And as you know, there's been a federal discussion taking place about um, whether, you know, you know, do you need do you need a federal legislation to to protect consumers from above? So at this point, I'll just turn this over to Jack, who's going to walk you through the federal discussion that's been taking place. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you to Colleen and her colleagues at NCSL for including us in this uh, program. Uh, I do want to talk about the federal legislation and um, really talk about the fact that there's it's been a lot of activity in Washington on this issue um, so far this year. There have been four different bills, uh, and I would note that all of them have been bipartisan. They've been all sponsored by the, both the, uh, the chair and the ranking member of the respective committees, and all four of these pieces of legislation have been approved, marked up, and reported out of their committees. Um, in addition, in December, the first two committees that acted, the Senate Health Committee and the House Energy and Commerce Committee, announced a compromise where they started with pretty similar bills, but they resolved some of the differences between those, those two bills. So in a sense, we just have now three versions, that compromise version across those two committees, uh, and then the uh, two bills that were approved just uh, last month in the House Education and Labor Committee and the House Ways and Means Committee. And I'm going to talk about some of the differences between these bills. Um, but I think, again, it's noteworthy that, that these have all been done on a bipartisan basis and have all passed out of their committees with pretty strong votes. Um, the scope of protection is, is pretty similar in the, in the core of the um, the bills do apply, so if you think back to the different criteria that Kevin mentioned, they do apply to, to all types of insurance plans, and of course including the self-funded plans that, that states don't have a jurisdiction over. Uh, the bills all deal with the emergency setting, they deal with post, you know, how to characterize post-stabilization care, and then they deal with non-emergency care in, in network hospitals, so those cases where you come in with your surgeon that you've picked in network, but it turns out that the anesthesiologist or the pathologist or the radiologist or somebody else is out of network. So the bills all share or dealing with across all the situations we typically talk about as being uh, surprise billing. Where they differ is on how they deal with the ambulance issues. So the, the, the compromise between health and energy and commerce and the education and labor bill both include air ambulance in their uh, protections. The Ways and Means does not do that. They do, however, create a reporting requirement to sort of create, collect some of the information that might be needed to, to do that regulation better, to do the rate setting better. I would note that there's also a Department of Transportation uh, Advisory Committee that was created and has started to meet this year um, because this, this law right now, under the Airline Deregulation Act, that's the law that prohibits states from acting. So DOT is at least considering whether there's a way they can act on it. And then finally, on ground ambulance, um, while neither the Health, Energy, and Commerce Compromise Bill nor the Ways and Means Bill um, include anything on ground ambulance, House Education and Labor does create a commission to try to consider how to incorporate protections for ground ambulance services. Um, and so they're at least taking a step in that direction. In terms of the basic consumer protections, again, there's a lot of agreement among these bills. Uh, in, in each of them, they limit consumers to network cost share, in-network cost sharing, application of in-network deductibles, and application of in-network out-of-pocket maximum. So basically, from a consumer's perspective, they're going to pay the same for this out-of-network doctor in these specific surprise billing scenarios as they would if they were seeing an in-network provider. No difference. And again, all of the bills include a specific ban on balanced billing uh, that applies to providers and to facilities. So again, they, they do that out-of-network facility issue for emergencies as well as uh, all the providers in these different settings. So from a consumer perfection point of view, while there's some details where these bills differ, they all really agree at the core of how this is being done. Where they differ a lot more is on the payment mechanisms. So just as Kevin described, there's a lot of differences among states in how uh, they've gone about payment. We've seen pretty substantial differences uh, in payment. And the big differences between the Ways and Means Bill you see there on the right 
and the other bills, the Compromise, Health, and Energy and Commerce Bill, and the Education and Labor Bill, which are more similar. So in those first, in those three committees that are in the earlier columns of the table, they really rely primarily on a payment standard, and they set the payment standard based on the median in-network rate that's used by that particular insurer. So the idea is the insurer should pay the same thing to this out-of-network provider in this surprise billing scenario as they would pay if that provider were in-network. Uh, they do you know, some technical things. They set that rate in 2019 and then inflate it forward to future years so that if there are differences in how um, payment rates change over time, uh, there's sort of a locked-in uh, insurance adjustment. That the, where the uh, well, let me continue on those bills. And they those bills have an option for dispute resolution that's limited to those cases where the amount in question is at least $750, uh, or in the case of Ed and Labor, if it's $25,000 for air ambulance cases. So again, the idea is people who have a particularly large bill in question. Uh, have the option, if they don't like that median then we are great, the provider can ask for arbitration and go through binding arbitration in that case. Uh, and it's the baseball-style arbitration where the two sides um, both submit a number and the arbitrator picks the number that, that seems to work better. Uh, the guardrails included here are both that, that higher threshold for where cases are eligible for arbitration the fact that the loser, losing side pays, so if you go into arbitration, you're at risk not only for not getting the additional amount that you're asking for, but having to pay a cost of arbitration, which might be in the range of three to four hundred dollars. And then finally, the consideration is what factors can the arbitrator consider in determining which of the two bids to accept? What they are allowed in these systems is to look at the median in-network rate, so they can compare the bids that the two sides make to what that payment standard was. They can also look at particular circumstances for that case, such as the training and education or experience of the provider. Uh, and Ed and Labor also added market share considerations that the arbitrator could look at. So if there was a particularly tight market or a very uh, open market in one particular uh, geographic area, then that could be considered. But in both cases, the committees prohibit the consideration of billed charges as one of the standards. And so that's something that's a response to some of the concerns about inflationary impacts in a state like New York that uses an 80% of, of bill charges, as, at least as an informal guide to the arbitrators, and some other states do as well. And so in, in the federal legislation, they're trying to be tighter with how the arbitration factors are considered. The differentiation here is with the Ways and Means Committee. They don't have a payment standard. Instead, they ask the sides to do voluntary negotiation and really try to reach their own agreement. There's a 30-day period for that. Uh, and then if, if voluntary agreement doesn't work, then you go to uh, a, a more formal uh, mediated negotiation arbitration process uh, that's binding and, again, uses baseball-style arbitration with the loser pays rule. Similar factors, uh, the uh, arbitrators can use median and network grade as one of the guidelines uh, but can't use the customary or bill charge uh, of the provider as one of the guidelines. So again, trying to, to limit the impact uh, on inflation. And then finally, these bills differ a bit in how they define the roles of states. So one of the things that all three bills do uh, is to defer to a state payment standard. For, so for those 20 plus states that have some kind of a, a state payment standard already in law, uh, the federal process would defer to, to what the states have. Um, and, and so that, you know, that would apply, of course, to those plans that the state can regulate. The self-insured plans that are subject to federal regulation, regulation would still use the federal method that I showed you a moment ago. But it does say that if the state has figured out a particular arbitration method or a particular statement, payment standard that's different than what the federal standard is, the states can continue. And at least as it's drafted now, it allows states to go on and enact bills in the future, which could be deferred to by the federal rule. So that's, I think, an important consideration to think about. Secondly, on enforcement, there's also, at least in the, um, the Compromise Health and Energy and Commerce Bill and the Ed and Labor Bill, uh, a deferral to the states for enforcement, the idea being that the federal government doesn't have that much of a mechanism for enforcing these kinds of rules on providers, and so looking to the states to continue in an enforcement rule. They do provide a federal backup for enforcement with civil monetary penalties, 
uh, and the Ways and Means Bill seems to be more totally dependent on federal enforcement. Um, so I think it's, it's interesting that we've got actually a fair amount of agreement on these bills. And as you think about where things are, I do think it's quite possible that federal legislation could, could act uh, this year. We still do need compromise across those proposals. It's something where, again, while there's a lot of agreement, there's some significant points of disagreement. We're aware that, that committee staffs are at this moment negotiating, talking to each other, trying to see if they can find common ground among the different approaches. Uh, and it's something that obviously needs acceptability among the stakeholders. If, if either providers or insurers or self-insured employers find a particular variant on this totally unacceptable, you know, that's going to have a political impact on this. There is a legislative vehicle. There are some extenders that need to be passed this year uh, with a deadline of May. Uh, and so the idea is that May is probably the opportunity for a compromise, if it can be reached, uh, to be passed into law. Um, the White House has been supportive of these uh, approaches generally to surprise billing, and so it's likely that if something can be passed by both chambers of Congress, that it will be signed by the President. And then finally, just coming back to, to emphasize, as Kevin did, that with or without federal action, there's still a lot going on in the states. As, as Kevin mentioned, Virginia and Georgia are very close to, to having laws in place. A number of other states are working hard on, on laws, plus some states are working to strengthen their existing laws and add, you know, fill in gaps. Uh, we saw last year where New York addressed uh, the issue of, of um, out-of-network hospitals, and we've seen other states go in and try to tweak their existing laws, make them stronger. Uh, and then just the final point is that uh, the inability to address air ambulance surprise billing has remained a point of frustration for state policymakers who, in a number of cases, have wanted to do something, have even tried to do something, but uh, are blocked for the most part by the Federal Airline Deregulation Act. And so I think there's going to be a lot of interest from states whether the federal law as it emerges will in fact include air ambulance protections as, as part of what they do. Um, ground ambulance still is going to remain an area that's, that's mostly untouched. And then I just want to, to follow with, uh, as Kevin mentioned, we have a lot of resources. So when you um, go back and take these, uh, these slides, you can see links here to the various uh, resources that we have through the Commonwealth Fund um, and some other locations. And with that, uh, I'll stop and turn it over to our, our next uh, panelist. Hi there, guys. My name is uh, State Representative Denea Esgar, and I'm from Colorado. I hope you all can hear me okay. Um, I ran and passed last year House Bill 1174 in the state of Colorado, um, which actually was our out-of-network bill that we were able to run. It's something that I have been working with consumers in Colorado for a long time, probably two to three years to try to get together. Um, it was a big deal for us in the state. We know that there was a lot of issues happening. Um, we had a few specific hospitals that were literally hubs for doctors who wanted to charge out-of-network or balance bill people and make a whole separate living on top of what they were making in that situation. Um, I can't tell you how important it was for me to work with the advocates. Um, I brought in um, the doctors, I brought in the providers, I brought in the facilities and pretty much said we're going to get this done and you can either be on board and help us make it work effectively or we're going to figure out how to make it work for you. And I'll, I wouldn't, I'd be lying if I told you it was an easy bill to pass. Um, we ended up passing nearly 46 amendments to the bill just to tweak language here and there to make sure that everyone was ready to go. Um, we actually implemented this January 1st of this year, and as you can imagine, we're still ironing out some things that are, that are coming to light. But what House Bill 1174 did was really required health insurance carriers and the providers and the facilities to provide patients um, covered by health benefit plans with information concerning that those services by out-of-network providers and in-network and out-of-network facilities um, what their rights were now as a patient. And again, I think somebody mentioned this earlier, this Colorado law only impacts Colorado regulated health insurance plans. So this bill actually won't affect payments covered by health insurance plans that are regulated at the federal level. Um, we knew that was going to be an issue, but what could we do? But follow Colorado law right now. So that's what we did. Um, 
we wanted to make sure that one of the pieces we're finding an issue with that I actually have to run a bill to fix this year is the disclosure requirements and the claims and payment process for the provision of out-of-network services. Mm -hmm. We found out that so many providers were so concerned with this bill that they're handing out these disclosure requirements left and right. We're talking about dentists. We're talking about your PCP when, in fact, this is really just for when you have an emergency situation and you go into an in-network facility and you aren't aware that an out-of-network provider is going to be um, seeing you. So we're working on kind of filling up that language this year. Um, we had a lot of questions around, um, for example, EMS. I know that you mentioned on the federal level, you guys are talking about air ambulance versus ground ambulance. And here in Colorado, we have so many different types of grand, ground ambulance providers that we couldn't just find a rate that worked for all of them because there's some mountain towns where it's a volunteer ambulance provider who uh, really, through no fault of their own, have no ability to bill otherwise because, as we know, many insurance, insurance carriers just don't provide um, ambulance coverage in their plans. Then you have other people like massive corporations who literally make profits off of the way they build um, ambulance services. So, um, in a way, we, I don't want to say we kicked it to the Commissioner of Insurance, but we really wanted to make sure that the Commissioner of Insurance, the State Board of Health, and the Director of the Division of Professionals were able to kind of sit down and promulgate rules. And we're still actually in the process of figuring out the right rules for specifically EMS at this point and also for our ER docs. Uh, we wanted to make sure that they are the experts in the field and they were able to really kind of dive into the disclosures, what the timing looks like, the format, the content and the language in the disclosures. So we're really still, although we passed the bill and a lot of people are actually being saved from the surprise network billing, uh, a surprise billing that they're receiving, we still have some kinks to iron out, that's for sure, even though we've been working on this bill for several years now that it's actually in play. I think it's a good thing. We're, we're open and we're still working on legislation to fix things. Um, we also wanted to just make sure that we establish the reimbursement amount for out-of-network providers that provide healthcare services to covered persons in an in-network facility. We really had a lot of conversations with different types of providers, and it was really surprising, I think, in this whole stakeholder process that we had to really find out what providers really rely on this type of balance billing to supplement the income that they do get here. A lot, I had um, some anesthesiologists tell me that if I did this, they would no longer be able, be able to afford to live and practice in Colorado. Um, still waiting to see the numbers of, of providers that actually have left the state. Um, I hope you can hear my sarcastic tone over the phone right now. Um, we still have... The only, the only medical shortages we have in Colorado right now really are nurses, LPNs, RNs, NPs. Uh, we're doing okay with our providers still, but we're still looking forward and making sure that what we put in place works. Um, and it does create a penalty for fa failure to comply with the payment requirements for out-of-network health care services. So I just, I guess my main point of really chatting today is keep working on these bills, keep figuring out what works in your state, do a lot of stakeholder work and you know I think one of the biggest lessons I took away last year was I went in to this idea last year thinking I knew exactly what we needed to do and who should be responsible and the more in-depth conversations we had there's a reason I had 46 amendments put to the bill because I truly wanted to hold providers harmless I really wanted to make sure our insurance carriers weren't going to have to increase rates um, to implement this and I wanted to make sure that the facilities weren't being harmed either, but at the same time ending this predatory practice. Um, here in Colorado, we've actually had several cases of patients getting liens put on their homes without them even being aware for going to the ER and having um, some type of procedure in an ER room that they, they of course, had no idea an out-of-network doctor or anesthesiologist or anyone in a surgical room um, being out-of-network. They had no idea that was happening. So. It was a massive issue we had here in Colorado. This bill clears it up, um, but also just remain open to ironing out all of the kinks even after you pass the bill. I thought I'd close the book on this bill, um, which took up the majority of my time and capacity last year, only to walk into session this year. 
and have some issues that we're still trying to iron out. And I, in fact, just submitted a late bill request. We end uh, on May 6th in the state. Um, I just put in a late bill request to be able to pull a bill to continue to work on this. So hopefully we'll get it figured out, but it's a work in progress, but I'm so incredibly proud of the work we've done and the money we've been able to save consumers in the state of Colorado. Great, thanks so much, uh, Representative. We really appreciate you sharing your um, viewpoint today. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and open it up now for Q&A, and as a reminder, if you could enter your questions in the Q&A box on the bottom left-hand side of the screen. Um, and our first question, it says, I am a Connecticut State Senate staff. We passed surprise billing protection in 2015 but we did not include ambulance bill protections. In Connecticut, it is additionally complicated because DPH sets a maximum rate. Also, the state has many types of ambulances and we're looking for a way to solve it. So I'll uh, pitch that over to our panelists and see if they have any suggestions. Representative Esgar, I would, this is Representative Esgar, I would check in even with your uh, Commissioner of Insurance and see if they have any ideas. They may know the different rates that the different ambulance companies have, but I'll also tell you they may not have that information. We found that out in Colorado that it's just not as, as simple as it being registered in a database somewhere. So I, but I would start there and really push on them to help you figure out the differences between the different types of ambulance companies you may have in your state. Um, but also, if you figure out how to find the right rate for all ambulance companies, let me know that too, because I'm actually in the middle of that fight right now in Colorado. And then I have another question here. For states that have voluntary provisions for ERISA plans, do ERISA plans actually participate? Um, and I'll pitch that one over to um, our Georgetown folks. Yeah, this is Jack. I mean, I can I can tell you the two main states that have these voluntary ERISA provisions are New Jersey and Washington. Um, both do have participating ERISA plans. Uh, there's a fairly lengthy list. It's, it's on uh, Washington's website. I think it's, uh, what, several hundred uh, uh, companies, including some modestly large one. We didn't see a you know, big manufacturer like Boeing on there, but we saw some public employee plans. New Jersey has a list uh, as well, I think it's so far it's a little bit shorter. So Washington's Washington's uh, system just went into effect the beginning of January, and New Jersey's around uh, part of last year. So it's still early to tell, but there is some take up at this point. Great, thank you. And I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, and we have one more. Nevada does have an opt-in for ERISA plans. The law just went into effect in January, and they have a few have opted in, so that's more of a common, I guess. And so I'll I'll pose one more question and wrap it up. So, um, and I'll I'll you, you know everybody can have a, a minute to chime in. So, what would be your biggest piece of advice um, for states that are considering surprise billing legislation? Uh, yeah, this is Kevin at Georgetown. Um, I mean, you, you know, we do have a fair number of states that have, um, you, you know, regulated in this area, and and they they come with all different um, models, and and so suggestion, and we've we've um, we've discovered this is important uh, for for the states that have recently uh, regulated in this area is to, is to um, explore. You, you know these the, the whole spectrum of models to see kind of what could potentially work for your 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 not only your market dynamics between your issuers and your providers, but also your political dynamics that have taken place. Um, you know we, we have states, um, red states and blue states, and um, they they've all taken different different approaches, and and I, I think it's well worth. Um, taking the time to really understand the different uh, models out there. This is Jack. I would just say that, um, you know, 
seen a lot of interest lately in these hybrid approaches where, um, you know, that we've seen in states like Colorado and Washington and some others, uh, including in the newer, the ones that are just emerging this year in Virginia and Georgia. Started losing you there, Jack. Um, Jack, are you still with us? We've lost your connection. Colleen? Okay. Um, well, Representative Escar or um, Mr. Kohler, do you have any response to that? Or uh, this is Donna. This is Edgar, as far as aid. Uh, she actually had to step out to start committee, so uh, she wanted to let me, or she wanted me to let you guys know that she appreciates you having her on this chat, and, and she enjoyed sharing her feedback with you. But she's not able to answer this question because she's uh, in committee right now. And, and this is Chris Kohler. I would say, apart from having a, a strong legislative leader like uh, the representative of Colorado, I think, um, and she kind of indicated this. In the end, I do believe this is a consumer protection bill, um, and, um, and it's important to keep their interests in place um, as you're dealing with um, providers who um, uh, are, are trying to capture revenues. So there are fundamentally di different interests, and while um, the, um, it's the job of legislators to work out compromises, it's also to um, uh, make sure that the loudest voices don't always set the laws. Well, thank you all for joining us today. And, and I want to thank our, all our speakers. And thanks again to um, Arnold Ventures as well. And thanks to all of you out there for joining us today. Again, this webinar has been recorded and will be made available on the NCSL website within the next week. And please don't hesitate to reach out to NCSL staff with additional questions. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.